All right, welcome along to the RT Soccer Podcast. Raf Giallo here and joined today by former Ireland international Keith Tracy and 42.ie journalist David Snade. It's a huge week with Stephen Kenny's Ireland facing Greece in Athens in their second qualifier of this Euro 2024 group and also for Vera Pau's side as the clock ticks down towards squad selection and the World Cup warm-up games. I've been speaking in depth to Greek football writer Vasilis Sambrakos and we'll be bringing you that interview from the Greek perspective in a wee while and we'll also review the Champions League final and the latest League of Ireland action later as well as a few other domestic stories but uh, let's talk international football first we have live coverage of Greece versus Ireland on Friday from 7 p.m on RT2 and RT player as well as radio coverage and a live blog online but before we touch on Greece and Gibraltar David um, there's the Tom Cannon story and this development emerged last night obviously he's been capped uh, at underage level for Ireland including the under 21 scored in March but he is now reflecting on his future now that England's FA has uh, shown their interest. So it's uh, it'll be interesting how this plays out. Yeah, well, I suppose like Everton fans will be buzzing because it means he'll, he'll either be lifting the Conference League trophy with them in, in a few years or even the Champions League, considering that's what the last two lads who uh, who defected have ended up winning at club level. Um, I listen, like at this stage, I know Stephen Kenny spoke about it in the at the training camp over in uh, over in Turkey, just saying that his agent Tom Cannon's agent that is, who's actually the brother of of David Moyes, was uh, in touch, just saying that yeah they've had an approach from the England twenty ones and he has to now kind of assess things a little bit. But I don't know. I think we're I think at this stage now we're kind of beyond. I think you can you, you have to get beyond the kind. We should be beyond the whole getting angered by it or kind of surprised by it. That's just now. And it has been for the last number of years, but maybe it's, we've been on the receiving end more of hot, more high, high profile situations, as I mentioned there with with Jack Grealish and Declan Rice. That this is just can be the nature of international football and and geo nationality players. He's like at a point in his career, I suppose, where he had a loan spell at Preston that just works. If you're looking for a loan spell from a club, it's pretty much gone absolutely perfect for him, and that's what has brought him onto that radar. Like finding that many scored that many goals consistently over a period of a few months for in the championship will no matter even if it's England or 21s that's going to take it's going to capture a bit of imagination it's going to get you a bit of interest so that's just the nature of the game you know he was in with Ireland he scored scored for, in that game wasn't it against Iceland down in Cork and he'd been around the in and around the players and stuff he hasn't really been in the senior the senior setup although he he would have been he had to pull he had to pull out of that and true illness as was said and because the Hansel there was an issue with but um, for that training camp in Bristol, like so, obviously he was on the radar where it was a case of right, have a look at him for the senior side. So that was the level where he was at in terms of that progression. So, listen, I think it seems, and thought it was a loss, wasn't the talk of uh, he deleted an Instagram post or his whoever runs his Twitter, his Instagram account had deleted his post after playing for Ireland. But the internet never forgets, Raf. The internet never forgets. <laughs> no, it certainly, um, certainly does not. No, so um. I think I think we should be beyond the whole anger thing at that point now, and and all the rest. But this is just now how international football goes, you know. Yeah, Keith, you're not on the internet. I think you've mentioned that uh, many a time in terms of social media. So I'm sure you weren't uh, keeping an eye uh, on Tom Cannon's Instagram or his uh, or his Twitter. But um, what do you make of the situation? Yeah, I think I find it all a little bit strange, really. Um, you know, I, I I feel when you when you play for your country, it's your country, it's it's what you represent, it's what's in your heart. I, I never thought you could pick and choose, oh, well, the English FA all of a sudden have shown some interest, so I feel a bit English now and I'm, I'm going to go and represent England. I just, I don't like that type of thinking and I'm sure if I, Stephen Kenny and I'm sure even Keith Andrews is having a look at this and thinking, well, if he wants to go to the other camp, let him go to the other camp because we want people who are fully committed here and like David said, I'm, we're, we're past anger, past all that stuff because Let's be honest, we've done it as well in the past. We've mixed some Scottish players, players from the north, even English players into our teams at times. So it's just the, it's just the way I'm on a football, I'm afraid. Yeah. And, and sorry, just on that as well, and it's the point, even just adding on to what, what Keith was saying about, like, because obviously when it's due to the Nationals, I know, how, like, before, say with the Declan Rice one, that's, I think that's a different scenario, isn't it? Because obviously he played senior level. And even with Jack Grealish, there was always that element. I remember speaking, I remember Grealish played in international for the 21s out in Tallis Stadium against Montenegro. And it was actually the same day of a senior match. I can't remember the senior game that was happening later on. 
and it was before it was before he really emerged at, at Villa. I think he might have been on loan at Notts County, but you know when you can see lads who are just levels above, even on a twenty ones pitch, and it was almost felt strange. You know, I mean, this in, I mean this in the nicest possible way that like he was even on a twenty ones pitch because you kind of expect those sort of players who are that much maybe on a different level, they kind of skip that 21 age group and international, they kind of go from maybe 17s or 19s and then are, are catapulted into the seniors. Um, If you remember with Grealish after the whole Aston Villa, remember he played in the semi-final for the Cup of Villa and he was fantastic against yeah. Liverpool. But even before then with the Martin O'Neill situation, he was like, well, you can see what's coming here. Like that performance was kind of coming and coming and coming and Ireland had the chance maybe to, to cap him and I know it sounds bad, they had the chance to cap him sooner and he waited and he dallied and then obviously tying it in with with, with Declan Rice after that, like that's part of the reason why we you could see the progression with Declan Rice, and that's why he he got those senior games. But at least with someone like Grealish, he kind of realised, well, do you know what? He felt it himself. I don't want to play senior football for Ireland because I want to. I feel as if I can go and do it for England. Rice maybe not quite the same. He kind of hedged his bets a bit a bit much, was a bit, which was a bit more frustrating. And I suppose with this instance with Tom Cannon. If it is that case, and one hundred percent, to be that conversation with agents and the value, and that's that's the business of football. But there could also be that other element too, well, with your nationality players, where he'd be happy to play into a certain point with with Ireland, and then as you say, if because England are the ones who've made this approach now, you know, it's it is concrete in terms of they do want them to be involved in their system, whereas maybe before he hasn't quite been at the level because obviously players will develop at separate, at different times. That's when he has the choice to make, and if he's taking that choice now, and we don't know what his decision one hundred percent is going to be, it's something that he's still debating. I suppose at that age as well, when he is still such a young man and it hasn't got the che- hasn't he has that decision to make, you kind of do have to maybe respect it a little bit and, and see what happens because, like when you get to for for him when he has that chance of playing for two different countries, you don't know. Like you, you do, you probably will go with your heart, and we could be saying, well, he was with Ireland, and why isn't he sticking? But it could be more Ireland because there was no other alternative, you know what I mean? And we were the ones who were giving him that chance. And like with other players who would have played for, the say, Northern Ireland, and then when they had that chance to play for the Republic of Ireland, that's what's in their heart. You do just have to respect it a little bit. And, and not so much move on for because we don't know what the decision will be, but just it kind of brings me back to the whole point and we won't discuss it now because I know we'd be, I'd be here for another hour talking about it, about just having that whole system in place where we don't have to rely on this type of thing all the time in terms of developing players and eventually it's something that would be an issue of the past but that's something for another podcast it might even be towards the end of this podcast with the 863 million the FAI are looking for because <laughs> yeah, yeah. it all ties into that sorry keep going just to pick up what David saying about what's in your heart I, I totally understand that but I find it very hard to believe that when you're 15 in your heart you want to play for Ireland you believe you're Irish and then all of a sudden you turn around to 2021 20, and you're good enough to get into the English yet, but all of a sudden then you start thinking, yeah, no, I feel English now. You know, and I'm not just saying it's Ireland, England. This happens at every country all over the place, you know, especially Brazil, Spain, France, everywhere it happens. But I, remember, I was only telling Rafa off air there. I remember when I was 16, 17, and uh, having a, a conversation with Mark Hughes at Blackburn and telling him that my father was originally born in Wales. And straight away, he gave me an avenue to get into the Welsh 21 set up. Oh, and really? Said, yeah. <laughs> Straight away, David, in my heart, I thought, I couldn't play for Wales. I don't feel one bit Welsh. I'm Irish. Yeah. And that, that's what was in my heart. Now, had I not been good enough to get into the Irish show, I wouldn't have diverted to Wales just because I wanted to play for the country. You know, what was in my heart was that I was Irish. And look, I understand there is some, some times it falls a little bit different for certain players. But generally, I think it's very, very black and white. It's what's in your heart. It's not, oh, well, I'm Irish now because I'm not good enough to get into the English show. And all of a sudden, now I'm English. I just... I don't understand that, to be honest with you. And I think players yeah. saying that they, they changed their mind, I think, is a, a big, big stretch of the imagination. I think it's the people in their ear off, off, off the pitches and what's getting them to do what, what is happening. Yeah, but for Stephen Kenny, anyway, from his point of view, the focus is all going to be on Greece on Friday and then Gibraltar on Monday. And Keith, I guess this is probably the more defining window of this uh, Euro 2024 qualifying group. I mean, the France window there was a huge amount of focus on it given the fact it was the world cup finalists and it was a bit of a free hit but in a way this is this is the real test uh this this coming week yes spot on raf uh, i think we all sort of expected to to get beat by france but what we wanted to do was show that we can evolve show that we're playing a bit of football 
for large periods, we kept Mbappe quiet, we kept Griezmann quiet, we did really, really well in the game. But this is the one everybody had their eye on, as you know, the double header, Greece, Gibraltar. I think six points is an absolute must. I think we need to beat Greece home and away, we need to beat Gibraltar home and away to try and get third place. And I think if we finish third in this group, we can't have any real complaints when you think of the, the French and the Dutch are going to be ahead of us in the group. We finished third. I think we're right there. But we need to beat the, uh, Greece home and away, Gibraltar home and away. And then can we go and get something against the Dutch at home? Can we get a draw against the Dutch at home? Can we get a, a draw against the Dutch away from home? It's a big, big ask. It really is. But look, at 12 points is a must against those two teams home and away. How good are the, the Greeks? They beat Gibraltar in the first game 3-0. They have some decent attacking players. And with the, with, the, with the French performance, I'm starting to get used to this Irish team now taking one step forward. And then yeah. just when you start with a little bit of hope, you get knocked back again. And I'm just looking at this Greece game thinking, is it going to come in the Greek game or is it going to come in the Gibraltar game? Are we going to have all the play against Gibraltar and then go and get a sucker punch? Are we going to draw against Greece? I just think there's something coming down the road. I'm not sure which game it's coming in, but I would, I don't want to say surprised, but I'm hopeful we'll have six points come Monday night, but I think the realistic view is probably more towards four. Yeah, and uh, David, I mean, I was reading your piece in the 42 just around the training camp. It seems to be running quite smoothly, and I mean, even um, they've got them de- um, to, the squad together to to watch a film, and it turned out to be the docu- the Kevin Moran documentary that was on RTE there a couple of weeks ago, Codebreaker. Mm-hmm. So it, things seem to be running um, running smoothly, at least in, in Turkey. Yeah, it was like... It's just one of them where obviously they've been obviously there since it was the Tuesday. I think they've been they've been there and they're going to be there until Wednesday morning training and they fly out Wednesday Wednesday evening to to Greece and then like it's it's a it's a long run in in terms of well it's a it's a it's a good old run in in terms of for to have for an international for an international manager with a group of players in terms of this is obviously the squad like before that was the the break in Bristol they kind of bridged that gap as I was mentioned in that piece about from the championship players and even the likes of say Troy Parrott as well who was going and obviously had gone back to Spurs after picking up that injury with uh with Preston, but um like yeah no, I just even speaking to a few people who who obviously involved in the camp and around the place and the staff and all, and like people who will tell you, I would say, and and will be upfront about it, like sometimes and Keith will know this as well at the end of the season, like they can be a bit maybe those sort of camps could be a bit laboured or they could be a bit sloppy and. Lads are obviously going to be nursing injuries, and they're going to be bodies are going to be sore. Now some lads have had a bit of a break, but by all by all accounts, it does seem to have been very productive in the sense of like the commitment that has been shown and the, the actual train and that's been that that's being done. And now listen, there's always going to be that element, isn't it, leading up to a big match? And Keith's absolutely spot on. He's laid it out in terms of what's going to be required and the importance of a game. People are always going to say, yeah, it's 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 a strong build up that things are being done right because that's what you want to feed that message out I suppose you know what I mean but then when you speak to people who <laughs> if it wasn't going well it would, would say if it wasn't going well that kind of helps kind of get your own view on, on where things are at and just even like the nature of say the training games and stuff and the fact little things like say Alan Brown the fact that he hadn't been able to train he hadn't played since April because of because of injury but hasn't been able to do full training but then could play get involved in the match and he's going to be an important player for all of the team in terms of even going to bring back Matt Doherty. It was a 16 minutes he's played since the last win international break at Atletico Madrid. Like that long, not, sorry, not even a long move. It was a permanent move to Atletico when his contract was cancelled at Spurs. Like he, was, as was put to me, he badly needed those minutes. And it was only once he got in and was trying that they realised how much he needed those minutes because he is a player who needs to be in that rhythm of playing regular football. Big one as well, Darrell O'Shea getting, getting some game time as well because obviously he played it every minute for West Brom up until his injury. And so again, like you're not, they're not going to get right up to speed straight away. But by the night, in terms of match fitness, because of the breaks that they've had since the season finished, but also some of those injuries, it is just a case where even with this window, it, it does feel like, and as Keith has said, like yeah, there's been many of those moments where it's f- felt like two steps forward or one step forward and then one back, or you you feel as if you know what you sense a bit of progression happening. And yeah, you got that in the in the France game, but. It was the kind of game, it was kind of performance and what you would expect from a lot of Ireland teams and how how they were and being that organised and being disciplined and setting up to it frustrate and try and have those moments on the break or in, in set pieces, which they had in the last few minutes of that game. But then this kind of game is just kind of, the Greece were a better side, but it kind of reminds me back of the last start, the last campaign where Armenia, when Ireland went down, and 
they just toiled when they had the ball. They couldn't. They weren't able to find a way of getting past Armenia, getting through. And they were the ones who got hit on the break. Like you speak to people about Gus Poyet and how he can have a side set up in Greece and that kind of uh, not nastiness that he has, but that bit of fire that he has and how he can get players going. It's going to be a battle, especially at home. It's going to be a game where if Ireland can come through it and get a win, it's going to be massive. Because then, then not that they put, well, whoa, they push the arms and they, after that, there can be no like there can be no slip up against Gibraltar after that. They just have to go and win and then get to six points. But if they go and win, it, it does feel as if it's an important moment for Stephen Kenny and for the staff and for his players and for his campaign that they go to a team like Greece and just get a win and put in a performance and, and then build on it. Because as, as Keita said, especially in this campaign, there'd be no shame in finishing toward in the group. Like no one's no one's expecting Norway to finish in the top two. But I do think as well the manner of how they might finish toward and how they go about it and do it will tell a lot for what could happen next as well. Yeah, and going back to something you said earlier, Keith, in terms of that sense of uh, you know going one step forward against uh, teams that are ab- above our level, like at least in FIFA rankings, and then compared to ones that are near our level or below, um, Greece are only three places behind uh, behind us in the FIFA rankings. They're fifty second. We're we're forty ninth. And is it a question? Where because this is and I think David kind of said it there. It um you know Irish teams in the past we've seen raise their level against the top sides, but then there's always been a slight tradition of kind of toiling against weaker nations, and it's happened under Stephen Kenny, and it's happened under a host of other managers previously. Is it an issue of just get uh, having a problem getting up for for games of that level, or is it uh, more because there's an onus on us having more of the ball, and maybe there's a there's an issue there. Yeah, I think it's a couple of things, Raph. I think uh, when we play the so-called lesser nations, they come, they play a low block. They It's very, very hard for us to break them down. And We always end up going back to the a playmaker in the midfield who can get on the half turn and play little slide balls. We haven't really got a player like that. I know Will Smallbone is looking like he can maybe do that. There's one or two on the fringes as well that are looking like he do that. But in terms of throwing them in against uh, European qualifier against Greece on Friday, there's nobody you really trust. So, I think we struggle. I think we played the, I wouldn't say the wrong formation because although Greece are below us in the rankings, I still see that they, I think they're going to have a little bit of the ball against us. So I think the, the three centre halves, the two wing backs will suit us in this game. We'll be able to spring out and hold them. But when we get the ball, we have to keep the ball. You know, with the, with the, with the 30 degree heat, we have to keep the ball, which that will entice the Greeks onto us. If their press is good and they can nick it on us, we're going to be in trouble. So, we just need to play a, a very a hybrid approach. If the press is good, you hold your hand and say, the press is good, we're going to play away from the press and then we make the Greeks break us down and we get nice and narrow. If we defend, and if our work rate is as high as it was against the French, if we defend like we did against the French, if our desire is up like it was against the French, then I think we'll beat the Greeks. Now, that's a huge, huge ask because, like I say, the heat is going to be tremendous. So the running stats need to be as close as they can be to the French game if they are then we have every chance with, with the talent that we have. And sometimes, don't force it through the middle. I'd imagine that the Greeks will probably play at least four or five in the middle of the park, maybe five at the back. They'll pack the boxes. They'll pack the middle of the pitch. So, I would mm. say, get Evan Bergs and keep them in the middle of the box. Put balls in there. Play for second balls in there. And once we hit the back of the net, give the Greeks nothing. But, look, the Greeks have some decent players as well. So, we're going to have to be defensively very, very good and keep the ball, which is... Defensively, I think we'll be okay, but in terms of keeping the ball and relieving that little bit of pressure, giving the legs a, a break, and when you look at the likes of Collins, is going to be a big, big player as far as on Floyd. You know, he hasn't had the minutes in the heat. Mentally, it's very, very easy just to switch off at two or three seconds. All of a sudden, you've lost a runner. You haven't picked up a second ball, and I just think there's an awful lot of question marks over a lot of our bigger players going into this game, Raph. And hopefully, I come out thinking they've done well, but you know, training camp, no training camp. It doesn't really help in terms of match fitness. I know you can be generally fit, but mm. those little movements about where to be, pitch geography, it's just you need that. That's match fitness. You only get that by playing games and even reserve games, training games, they, they're not the same. Believe me, they're not the same. So there's a lot of question marks over a lot of Irish players. And I'm just uh, I'm just not too sure. I think, I think, like I said, I think there could be a, a little sucker punch waiting for us here. Yeah, and as the Greek football writer Vasilis Sambrakos, who um, we're going to hear from very, very shortly, um, he was explaining that Greece play this kind of asymmetric 4 3 3. So the, um, the forward three, there's a centre forward, a, a kind of traditional winger on one side, and then the other winger 
always looks to cut inside. So as you said, a free centre back, one of the three Irish centre backs is going to be key in terms of progressing possession. You mentioned also um, keeping Evan Ferguson in the middle, which uh, then you, you have to look at the characteristics, I guess, of who a strike partner is going to be, Keith. And who do you feel would be best in terms of running into the channels? Will it be Parrot, Ida, or, Parrot, Ida, or um, um, Abafemi? Well, straight away, if if everybody was on a level playing field, I'd say Obi Femi. But with the lack of minutes that Obi Femi has, I could see why maybe go for a part or a neither. But personally, I would keep Ferguson there because Ferguson he, he loves just dropping into the middle of the pitch and getting the ball, and he attracts players with him. An awful lot like Harry Kane, and you know everybody's liking Ferguson to Kane already, so that's nothing new. So when he drops into the middle of the pitch, you need somebody who's going to take the attention of the other great defenders and think. He's a little space that I can't I can't go in with Fergus. And if you do, you chip it over Ferguson's head and you get all the family to run after it. And all of a sudden they won't want to be coming into the middle of the field. Ferguson might get on it. And you know, I just think all the is perfect to run them channels and then you get maybe Doherty. I, I would imagine Doherty would play right wing back, maybe Odell with our left wing back. They need to pick and choose the moments that they're gonna get involved in the game. Like I say, we're playing Greece, they are below us in the rankings, but we need to give them respect. Junior internationals are always difficult for everybody, you know. There's certain players in our team have lots of minutes, certain players have no minutes, so it's going to be disjointed. There'll be players, and the likes of Cullen will think, I want to go and press, 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 press. But there'll be other players that can't keep that tempo, that can't go and press every minute. So that needs to be communicated through the team. We need to, we need to hunt as a team. We can't go hunting as individuals, because if you do, the Greeks will bop us, and all of a sudden, we're getting very disjointed. So communication, and look, I, I think all the family would be brilliant. Small ball, maybe with the look. Oh, do, do you want to hear me team? Like, I have a team that like, yeah, go me. for it. Yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I'm going for the Zuni wing goals. Uh, Collins, Egan, O'Shea is the three center halves. Doherty is the right wing back. Odelda as the left wing back. Cullen and Knight as me two uh holders in midfield. And I have a brown slash small bone because I know Brown hasn't had an awful lot of minutes. I'd love to play him there, but. I think maybe small bone just to give us that little bit of stardust when we uh, when we break one degrees and all the family and fairies and up front. Yeah, and uh, David, I presume it is going to be sort of more or less that anyway. Perhaps maybe there might be one or two um, differences yeah. in the final team. Yeah, maybe Malumbi. I think Malumbi could be one of the two, especially if we're talking about intensity and pressure. I think he might. I think he'll have it. I think he might be in instead of maybe Knight. I think he'll be the one who might be in besides Colin. That seems to be the kind of back preferred access there. On the right hand side, just a little thing stood out just even from what Stephen Kenny was saying about the fact that Will Smallbone struck up a has struck up a good rapport with, with Matt Doherty in terms of on the pitch and that understanding. Like stuff like that will stick in manager's head, won't it? And selections is, obviously that's what at club level that will be important, but even more so at international level when when you've got even less time to work together. If you have a if you do have those little partnerships on the pitch that kind of seem to click, that will that will could be something that will swing it. And also, also Smallbone, I know it was Lafayette, but Smallbone, well, in, in, in against a team who did sit a bit deeper and looked to frustrate Smallbone, showed that he has that bit of pass. I remember saying, I only saw him live once for Stoke last season. It was against Reading, he actually scored. And what actually struck me was he did, he kind of played on the right hand side of a midfield, kind of two, that was a three. And I kind of, maybe, because even prior to that, I'd seen him a bit first with Hampton on TV and I'd seen him a couple of times for the 21s. I thought he was a bit more of a luxury player, maybe someone who wanted to maybe not have much interest in the defensive side and then would, as Keith said, have that bit of stardust when, when come alive in the final tour. But he put a shift in, in fairness. So he actually had that, he kind of reminded me a little bit of Jamie McGrath's performance when Jamie McGrath played out against Portugal in terms of just, he... I don't know if this makes sense. He was scanning very well when he wanted to get on the ball and get home, but also on the opposite side when he wanted to see well, where do I have to be defensively and the runs he was making, he actually was a lot more dynamic than I actually gave him credit for previously, He, he which kind of would strike me that he would fit into that system with Ireland as maybe above one of the two midfielders on that side because he could drop in and if we are or getting overloaded in midfield, to come almost like a third midfielder, but then when he has to spring forward, he can do that as well. And he scored in that game I was at as well. He took his finish really well, so he fought at the edge of the box. And it was something at the time, which maybe not overlooked as well, the fact John O'Shea would have been first team coach at Stoke City then. He's now obviously now part of the Irish setup. And uh, even O'Shea, I was speaking to him after the game, just like the relationship they have, they do a lot of work. They did a lot of work together at club level in terms of O'Shea picking out clips, going through stuff. 
and wanting putting the pressure on him, small ball and saying you have to deliver more. Like the talent he has, like forget you forget if it wasn't for that crucial knee injury, he probably might have established himself even more so in Southampton in the Premier League. He was getting to that level, he was in getting in, getting games before he had that injury. And like there has been that kind of emphasis with with him at Stoke and at, and at Ireland and John O'Shea being one of those people to kind of bring more out of his game in an attacking sense and I think oh, I, I think he might get I think he'll be in with a show a serious show of playing I do yeah and obviously as we said the game is live on Friday night 7pm RT2 RT player uh, also on the radio and uh, we're going to have a live blog on rte.ie but we also before most of these uh, international breaks we always try and get a bit of an opposition view and I was delighted to be joined by Vasilis Sambrakos Athens based football writer analyst and journalist who is the author of The Miracle the football team that shocked the world obviously a reference to Euro 2004 and it's a really good book details um, some of the small details that we wouldn't know about in terms of what made that team special and how Otto Ray Hagel built it over, over time but the first thing I asked him was about the dark period that the last nine years have been, which has seen them drop down to 52nd of the FIFA rankings after the end of their decade long golden era. Uh, Vasilis, first off, I have to say, really enjoyed the book. It's a great detailed, uh, you know, review of how Greece, as the title of the book says, shocked the world, not just shocked Europe in 2004. I certainly remember the tournament firsthand. Um, it's probably it's probably the only time in terms of a major football tournament that I've been left stunned by who the winner has been, and obviously it's a great moment for your for your country. But as we come to this Euro twenty twenty four qualifier between Ireland and Greece, um, Greece are currently fifty second in the FIFA rankings, three places behind Ireland, and it seems the last nine years or so have been a bit of a darker period compared to the golden era that had uh, preceded it. Yeah, Ralph, first of all, thank you very much for your kind in, uh, invitation. It's a, a great pleasure for me talking with you. And of course, it's always a pleasure for me to to talk about the Greek national team. Although here in Greece, you know, we don't love our national team much. We only love the team when um, they succeed something. Um, whenever they are overachievers, then OK, they are national heroes. But only at that time and only for a short period of time. Uh, so we don't have the um, mentality that uh, uh, the national team comes first. Everybody in uh, uh, Greece, uh, they are fond of their clubs, not of uh, their national team. So these days, the um, uh, coach of the national team, Gaspoyet, is struggling to persuade the football fans that uh, there is a, a reason and uh, they have to, to find a meaning in uh, attending the game against the Republic of uh, Ireland. Because, uh, in, uh, as you said, during uh, the last um, nine years, um, because of uh, the team's absence for, uh, from every big tournament, um, Greeks, they have uh, forgot the national team. Maybe I would say that they, they learned not to hate the team, but... Um, not to support the team. Uh, so every um, coach uh, since 2014 uh, was struggling to persuade the fans that uh, his addition of the Greek national team would worth it. So these days, Poyet, after what uh, the team uh, did in uh, their campaign for the Nas Nations League, you can say that um, he he created something like a spirit. In nowadays, uh, people okay, they are waiting to see what uh, is going to be done uh, during the European qualifications. But uh, okay, you can say that they have learned that this team could have a possibility to to be in the Euros. So uh, this is a. a I can't say a new beginning because uh, Boyet is here since uh, February uh, 22. So, uh, yes, this team is fresh. It's not new, but it's fresh. But uh, this team uh, has not, they have nothing to do with that team, the team uh, who won the Euros in uh, 2004. Yeah, it was a miracle. Um, it is, it was, and it will be the football story of our lives. So that's why I, I found the meaning to uh, write this book. Uh, 
<laughs> because uh, I was always saying that I have to pass this story to the next uh, generations, not only of Greeks, but uh, footballers in general, because I think that um, through this story, uh, every little team in the world uh, could hope, could find um, a way to work their minds in order to overachieve. So uh, th that's why I did that. And I have to say, um, uh, today I was in um, in the cab of the national team, uh, mm -hmm. where some of the players are already there working for uh, the next matches. And I could see, because there are uh, players who are at their 20s or 20-something, so they are people who were not born or they were babies when uh, the national team won the Euros, so they don't know the story. And um, I'm happy because I can understand that uh, through this book they can understand what happened and how that team was uh, created. Yeah, and Otto Rehagel, the uh, German coach uh, who has who had achieved plenty before taking over the Greece job uh, at the time that he did, he's the key figure in your book and obviously the key figure who guided Greece to Euro 2004 glory. And it's interesting, Greece's football, Greece's football history in terms of internationals, uh, the years ending with four are very significant. You qualify for the World Cup in 94, you win Euro 2004. And uh, then, of course, you uh, reach the knockout stage of the World Cup for the first time in 2014. And all um, the latter two achievements, um, particularly the Euro 2004 win, would not have been possible, I imagine, without Otto Rehagel's wife, uh, who is a, actually a key figure in the book, um, Beati. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because she, she was back at those years. She still is. But uh, at those years, she could uh, she she was something like an agent for uh, uh, her husband. So yeah, she was the one who chased it, uh, decided to send uh, his uh, CV to the Greek National uh, Football Federation. So yeah, uh, she was crucial. <laughs> her part was crucial in uh, what it was uh, the the biggest uh, football story ever for us Greeks. Uh, I, you know, I, could, I can find some similarities in the way uh, Gaspoyet is handling issues these days uh, with what uh, Otto Hagel did back at those years. Uh, we always used to say about Rehagel that he was always listening only himself, only his mind, that uh, he could uh, live far from Greece uh, and he was coming in Greece only for the matches and uh, the trainings. And then the other day after the latest uh, match or the latest training, uh, he would uh, depart to go back to Germany or wherever he wanted to, to live. And um, in that way, he managed to close his ears to, uh, to Greek football society. And this was key for uh, his um, uh, decisions, the way he handled uh, things in uh, the national team, his leadership in general. So these days, uh, this interesting guy, Gaspar Yet, is doing some things that um, you can say that he is following the path. Because now he decided not to call a couple of uh, players whom Greek fans are thinking that they, uh, they speak very high uh, of them and they, they thought that they had to be in the national team. Uh, one of them is a midfielder. His name is uh, Kostas uh, Fortunis. He plays for Olympiakos. And uh, the other guy is a, a striker, an attacker, uh, Tassos Duvikas, who plays in uh, Holland. And he was uh, the first um, uh, scorer in uh, the league over there. So uh, I can say that um, Poyet is trying to communicate that he is calling the players who thinks that they fit in his plans and that uh, they can be members of a team, not the best players. So um, I, I think that, uh, you know, the results will tell if Greeks, they will follow his way or they will demand uh, from the Federation to sack him uh, after uh, one or two bad results, because this is what... Um, Greek uh, football history is made of stories like this. Uh, uh, a coach decides 
to do a thing, a uh, bad re- result comes, and then he will uh, leave. Yeah, because as you mentioned in your book, Rehagel had a very tough start to begin with. And then there's the England match where, and I remember watching that match live at the time as well, where David Beckham obviously scores the, the free kick at the end and it's a two-all draw and it's the start of something. But you mentioned how Rehagel built his team around the Panathinaikos team that was successful around that time. And then his focus was building a team uh, that were all largely picked from players who had experience of playing in big European competitions. So Olympiakos, AK Athens and the players abroad. And I wonder with Poyet now, because looking through the squad, there aren't a lot of players with a high amount of Champions League experience bar Simicast maybe at Liverpool or um, the goalkeeper um, Vlacadimos at Benfica. And I wonder how does he balance that? Because the quality levels, I think it's a problem we have in Ireland as well. We don't have a lot of players who play Champions League football. And it it seems it's a huge challenge to try and surmount. Yeah, yeah, it is. And uh, this is one of the key factors in uh, Poyet's mind. Uh, that could, uh, how can I say, decide uh, the future in this uh, round. Um, last week, uh, we had um, an off-the-record meeting with some of uh, Greek uh, uh, sport journalists, and he was uh, saying that um, he is making a wish for all the Greek clubs to um, find their way to the European uh, um, round. Not only the uh, preliminary, the qualifying rounds, right, yeah. but to qualify to be uh, in a group stage. Yeah. Uh, it would be the Champions League for Ike or Panathinaikos. It will be Europa League for uh, Panathinaikos, Ike or uh, Olympiakos. He he's feeling uh, that there is a, a very strong need for Greek players to play abroad, uh, facing uh, bigger clubs better teams, uh, uh, how can I say, uh, a higher rhythm of the game. So, of course, on the other hand, uh, all these clubs, they don't have many Greek players in their uh, lineups. So this is another difficulty for uh, Poyet. Um, yes, he he's, he he's saying that players like Tsimikas, they have to, to be in the national team bigger than they are in their clubs. He used the example of Tsimikas. He said, okay, this season in Liverpool, he didn't didn't find his uh, space. But when he's coming in the national team, he's one of the most important players. So he needs from players like Tsimikas to be something like leaders in field. Uh, he has a player who is the captain of the, of the team, Bakasetas, who plays for, for uh, Trabzospor. And he had a very good season, not only in the Turkish league, but also in the uh, European competition. So he has a player uh, in whom he relies on. He thinks that um, Bakasetas can lead the team. And uh, he, uh, uh, besides that, he is the player who scores for the national team. So you can say that he is the key player for uh, Poyet uh, these days even though at the beginning Poyet didn't have Bacasetas in his mind as a regular. He all, always wanted him to be in the, in the squad, but uh, he was planning something different. But Bacasetas scores, so he needs uh, the player and uh, he relies on, on him. Yeah, uh, you, you can say that there is, a, there is a lack of, not experience, awareness maybe, Maybe the players, they don't feel very comfortable uh, in big matches when uh, the opponent is not from Greece. So this is one of the challenges for uh, the national team. The other challenge is to get used with the new home ground because they they have only used uh, the new stadium of uh, AAK Athens for one match, a friendly one. So this against the Republic of Ireland will be the first match in uh, that stadium. Prices of the tickets are, you can say, high for um, a, a game for, of the national team because, I, as I told you, Greeks, they don't support, they don't strongly support the national team, so they need a motive in order to go to the stadium. And these days, uh, the coach is trying to... Um, to make the federation 
uh, do more things in terms of marketing in order to persuade fans to create a hype about the national team. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not uh, very optimistic about it, but okay, he's trying. And, uh, I have to credit that to him. Yeah, and in terms of the, I suppose, the football culture, in terms of style of play, because, of course, uh, outside of Greece, I think there was a perception that the team that won Euro 2004 was ultra defensive and, you know, based on set pieces. And uh, I'm kind of cu- curious about the legacy of that going forward and how that's evolved, because we've had a, I don't know how familiar you are with Irish football history, but when we went to the World Cup in 1990, 1994, and then also Euro 88, our manager, Jack Charlton, played a very direct style of football. And it's only now now really under Stephen Kenny, the current manager, there, there's this attempt to evolve, play out from the back. Um, there have been instances before that, have, you know, spontaneous instances under previous managers, but where it's become a bit more of an ideological thing seems to be now. And I wonder, as Greek football, has, uh, especially at international level, has it had to go through that path after, like, post Ray Hagel? Yeah, the, this is a big issue for us. I can say about the Greek national team, I can say that uh, since uh, the former coach of the national team, since uh, John Van Schip, the team started to play uh, because he was his game model was, was based on uh, possession. So the team tried to build up, they tried to keep the ball, to be calm with the ball, uh, to, to have the ball most of the time. Uh, especially against the uh, opponents uh, who were not uh, the biggest uh, teams of uh, Europe. So, yeah, you can say that uh, Poyet is trying to follow his path. So, until now, um, in the Nations League level, where we were in the League C, uh, yeah, the national team tried to keep the ball, to uh, change the rhythm, to uh, make a lot of uh, attacks, to create... They they were creative. Uh, as far uh, when you talk about his game model, uh, he is always playing four three three, and he always likes to have one winger and one f- forward who plays as a winger. So uh, he always likes for the second winger to cut inside and be to support the central um, attacker and to be close to the other players because. He knows, Poyet, that um, Greece, they don't have many times the opportunity to play uh, in the final third. So his idea about the national team is that um, if he brings the players closer, then he has more possibilities, more options, more possibilities to uh, uh, to execute, to, to have a, a chance to score. Uh, so with, he, with him... Uh, at the bench, you can say that we have seen part in games where uh, the national team, they were creative. But, uh, you know, there is no rush uh, from all of us uh, to um, uh, to say that um, in that way, they can succeed a qualification in the final stage of uh, Euros. We are... I, I can say that we are optimistic, but not f- from this path. Through the, na- uh, through the Nations think, League. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 We, we think that uh, the, the vision uh, through this um, uh, round, the European qualifiers, is for the team to believe in themselves that they can do it from the other way. Um, we think that the nightmare would be uh, big defeats from uh, France, from the Netherlands. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, as I, I told you before, we don't really love the national team. So if uh, they will lose 5-0 from uh, France, we will demand uh, to sack the coach, to change the players, to to change everything. So this is what they are trying to avoid uh, through the European qualifiers. Uh, for example, I was watching the highlights uh, from the uh, the match um, between uh, Republic of Ireland and France, and I would say that if I was Gaspo yet, I would sign uh, for a performance like um, Ireland did against uh, France. Um, ab- about uh, Republic of Ireland, yeah, I can say that I understood that they were trying to play football, not only to destroy or uh, sit back and uh, try to suffer. 
So this is very interesting about the upcoming match because I think that with the, the mix of some players who are playing abroad, they are playing in uh, big clubs, so uh, they, they can behave. And uh, the youngers who are skillful, <laughs> from what I, I can understand, uh, this will be an, a very interesting challenge for uh, Greece. Yeah, and in terms of the creating a club mentality, because that's something Ray Hagel did in terms of trying to break down the divisions. As you said, there's sort of a divide in, in and it's different from Ireland where most of all of our players pretty much play abroad. So we don't have that club divide um, domestically. But in Greece, you have some huge clubs, Olympiakos, as we said, Panathinaikos, AK Athens, and also Pauk as well have, have become successful in recent times. And the um, did the issues between the big, you know, the big club players, did that reemerge after Ray Hagel? And has Poyet had to do something about that? Obviously, as a past AK Athens manager as well. And as a foreign manager, it doesn't make it a bit easier for him basically to deal with that compared to say a uh, domestic manager. I have to say that uh, he is lucky, not only because he had the experience in the past uh, as a manager in AEK Athens, but also because the former manager, uh, Fans Hib, did a lot of work in order to create a team spirit in the national team and to, um, how can I say, to put out of the team Every player who used to go to the national team with the same man mindset he had in his uh, club. Um, this um, Super League, our uh, championship, was very tough, very hard, because every big club um, tried to, to win the title. So in the, during the playoffs, you know, the, the atmosphere in Greece, it was toxic, very toxic. So there are a lot of fights, public fights between um, uh, presidents, major shareholders, executives, uh, things like that. Um, a lot of bad noise uh, about football. So this could uh, be in the in the dressing room of uh, the national team. But until now, you know, I, I'm I'm not uh, 100% because they will start the preparation for those matches on Monday. So on Monday, they will be everybody in the squad. But at the, until now, uh, they don't have anything. Um, and this is um, a big step for the national team because since uh, 2014 until 2021, Things were bad in uh, in the locker rooms. So yeah, you can say that he is lucky because uh, <laughs> the other guy, <laughs> the Dutch one, made uh, a lot of work in that uh, part. Yeah, and what's the you know you've talked about you know you've watched Ireland a little bit, so you have a sense of what Stephen Kenny's uh, system kind of looks like. Albeit against France, was which is going to be a very different game to what's ha what's going to happen in Athens. But uh, what's the general view of Irish football within Greece? Is it is there much known about some of our players? I mean, I mean Evan Ferguson is the one we talk about a lot now. What he's doing at Brighton at a, such a young age at eighteen, but. Do do people in Greece would they be able to you know do they watch the Premier League closely or the Championship in England? Yeah, uh, Greeks they love the Premier League, <laughs> as everybody in the planet. So yeah, they watch a lot. So they know the players who are playing there. Um, but as I told you before, they don't attend uh, European football enough uh, on this level, on uh, national teams level, only at final stages when uh, a Euro. Uh, is on or a World Cup is on, then the Greeks will follow. So now I can tell you that they don't have, they don't know anything about uh, the opponent. They will know and they will, how can I say, they will know every detail when France will come because of Mbappe, but they don't, um, uh, they don't follow the news about the national team. So that's why you will see that uh, media outlets, they don't have uh, many words about uh, the national team. It's like nobody really cares about the national team. And this is one of the biggest problems um, football has, they have in, in Greece, that um, 
people they don't care about the national team. That's why the national team they don't have facilities, they don't have a preparation center, they don't own anything. Although they did something like that they uh, they did in 2004. Uh, they they didn't we didn't learn anything uh, out of the, of that Yeah, so that's a, it's an interesting legacy because uh, it would have been, I suppose, for Greek football, you reach the mountain top, but it, trying to stay there would have been, uh, you know, well, trying to stay close to it. Obviously, winning another European championship would have been very, very difficult. Obviously, but yeah. um, in terms of youth production and uh, the profile of the squad, is is it does it mostly is it mostly the responsibility of those clubs, AEK, Panathinaikos, Pauk, and Olympiakos, in terms of driving the young players through and producing them or does it actually happen across the country and the big clubs basically hoover up the best talent uh Pauk and uh, Olympiakos are the clubs who are um trying to produce players to they they have spent they have invest a lot in order to create a network and to um to gather all uh, talents from Greece especially Pauk they have done uh, um, a lot of good things uh, during the latest uh, decade all the others are trying to to buy you know um, a player who is already ready to play for um, this level uh, um, so these days not only these days uh, since 2018 Uh, every uh, coach uh, was trying to find players abroad players who were playing who were uh, greeks second generation or third generation greeks who were playing in germany in czech republic in romania everywhere uh, because uh, they were playing in their clubs and this was a huge difference Uh, because you know Greeks Greek teams they don't trust they don't easily trust the youngers we don't have that uh, mentality and um, <laughs> it's one of our problems so these days we only have one talent who is a creative player uh, and is now in the national team his name is Yanis Konstadelias and he plays for Pauk uh, he you can say that he's um, Uh, an offensive midfielder he can play number 10 he can play number 8 he can be a winker he can be ev- everywhere he also has played in the younger generations as a, uh, an attacker uh, forward uh, he's a very skillful player and uh, everybody is hoping that this guy will prove to be uh, the next uh, leader of the national team um, apart of, from, of, from him There is a defender who also plays for uh, Pauk, um, a central defender, center half. Uh, his name is uh, Kostadinos Kulierakis, uh, but I don't expect him to be a starter for uh, the national team in those matches. Um, and all the others are um, older, um, more than 22 years old, more than 24 years old. Uh, we don't have many players who were uh, came during the latest two years from the league and uh, are now in the national team. No, we don't. Yeah, and there was an interesting point you made in your book um, about the the you know the the childhoods of the generation that won Euro 2004 and went to the 94 World Cup that they grew up in periods of hardship. in the uh, in the 70s and 80s and then you know things have changed since then there was prosperity in the 90s and 2000s but then like Ireland was affected by the economic crisis and I know obviously within the EU Greece was probably the hardest hit um and you know you you talked about a different mentality depending on when players uh, came through and I wonder for now again those youngest talents that are coming through that uh, you know may have been born or you know were quite young when the economic crisis happened most recently from 2008 onwards they haven't quite reached the period where they're first team footballers but do you think that might actually have a in I suppose in a in a way it'll be a blessing in disguise in terms of a, a mentality in the long term yeah yeah maybe uh, i can say that i'm, I'm making uh, thoughts like uh, this uh, these days um 
you know, now we have the national team gathered together, so we are st- we started thinking about them. Um, you know, the thing is that uh, that team had a lot of strong personalities. This team, they don't have enough. But yes, if I can compare this team with the, the national team um, four or five years before, yeah, I can say that uh, now I can understand that there are some players who are eager to succeed and uh, they, um, they, how can I say that? Uh, they see that football will give them uh, what the whole family uh, or the whole village or the whole city are expecting from them to give back. So, yeah, you can say that. Yeah, I can say that. Yeah. But um, the other thing is that we don't have enough leaders in the in the team. And, you know, this is nothing you can be trained. Uh, you have to have it inside inside you so these days th- there is um you know the, the, there was a tradition in the national team since 2004 that the oldest would decide not the uh, no it's not uh, correct they will prepare the next captain so they uh, they were always trying to raise the next captain of the team this was uh, how can I say, destroyed for more than five years because of the uh, the relations between the players. But nowadays, yeah, I can say that uh, I feel that uh, coming back. So this is good for the for the Greek national team, yeah. Yeah, and you mentioned the uh, the captain of the current team already, Baka Shetas, and I wonder what do you or who do you expect to be in the starting eleven against Ireland in Athens in terms of uh, from goalkeeper up to forward. Oh, uh, the thing is that we we still don't know uh, who are going to be in the camp for the, these matches, but um, you can say that um, Vlachodimos will be the um, goalkeeper. You can say Timikas will be at left as a left back. Um, Mav- Mavropanos uh, will be one of the central defenders. He the came. Through, he came through at Arsenal, didn't he as well? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, and uh, the couple of the latest uh, years, he played in uh, Bundesliga for Stuttgart, and he was doing well. So yeah, I think uh, he will be the other one. Hadziriakos maybe will be the other central defender. He he's an, an experienced player. He plays in Holland and he's doing well all these years. Um, the central midfielders, hmm, Schiopis will be one of them. The other one, I can't be sure. Maybe Kurbelis will be the other one. Uh, he was playing for Panathinaikos and now he is going to sign for uh, Trabzonspor. Um, Pavlidis will be the forward, I think. Or Yakumakis. Um, th- those two are fighting for uh, one place uh, at starting 11. Um, I think that Limnios will be one of the winkers, a player the winger of the winkers, <laughs> if I can say. In, yeah, the, the uh, widest, system. widest player, yeah. Yeah, the widest player. Uh, he plays at right. And uh, then at left, I think he will play with Masuras. Uh, he plays for Olympiakos because this is the forward of the wingers, the guy who can uh, cut inside, uh, play uh, more central and play combined with uh, the forward. And... Um, Bakasetas will be his. You can't. I can't call him number ten, but he will be the central midfielder who will be more not only more creative, but the one who will take some shots. He will try to to score. So these are the key players for uh, the Greek national team. Yeah, and the one factor, uh, I suppose, before I let you go, that we've been talking about a little bit here in Ireland is the heat. That's why our, our team have gone to Turkey at the moment. They're in Antalya for a training camp for nine days and then before they go to Athens. And um, I wonder what temperature, what are the temperatures like at the moment in Greece, in like across June? And 
uh, how big a factor do you think that will be? Because um, we're not used to like I I don't like the heat myself, and I can imagine most people I've grown up with we don't uh, we don't tolerate it, so we might find it a little bit hard. <laughs> yeah, I know. I feel you. I know. Uh, the thing is that uh, um, yesterday, Ju- uh, June sixth was the first day of summer in Greece. I mean, it was the first day uh, when the temperature was more than twenty five. Uh, Celsius. So uh, now nowadays the temperature is close to 30, but not 30, below 30. So yeah, we we didn't feel uh, any heat the, until now. So <laughs> I can tell you though that uh, the area where the stadium of AEK Athens is located is one of the most heated areas in Athens. Uh, not, that's all... not what I wanted to hear. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I have to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> but the stadium is modern, so you can uh, expect uh, <laughs> the support of uh, uh, all the facilities. So, yeah, um, I think it will be close to 30. Uh, but, you know, uh, we are in 2023, so we are getting used to changes, a lot of changes in climate. Yeah. So you never know. <laughs> you never yeah. know what to expect. <laughs> yeah, if we if we if there's a heavy rain and a bit of a snowstorm, I think it works uh, possibly a little bit better <laughs> for yeah, us. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but look, Vasilis, uh, thanks a million for taking the time. Obviously, the book for people who want to read, and I definitely recommend it. The miracle, the football team that shocked the world, and also I understand you have like a YouTube channel where you um you do analysis and uh, yeah. different bits of reviews of Greek football as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm trying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah it was a pleasure for me also. And uh, of course, it will be very interesting to see what will happen in this qualification round. Uh, best of luck to everybody. All right, that was Vasilis Sambrakos. And uh, it was a really detailed, uh, I suppose, insight into Greek football, but also the team that Ireland are likely to face on Friday night. And in terms of the Ireland women's team, the next milestone for Vera Pau's side is the friendly against Zambia next week on the 22nd of June. And then the final squad is named on the 29th and whittled down from the 31 player training camp squad. And also captain Katie McCabe, who was in the Champions League team of the season, has got the green light to link up with the Ireland squad in time for that Zambia friendly as well, because that in terms of player release has been an issue. But uh, let's turn to the Champions League final. We had live coverage of it on Saturday night and uh, Manchester City have achieved their um, treble, but uh, Keith, they were made to work for it by Inter Milan. Yeah, they were. And, you know, the, the, most of the, the people I spoke to about the final, they were very, very confident of a City win. I was confident of a City win. And you know, people were saying, you know, I think this could be four or five. And I was thinking, there's no chance. Not with the way the Italians set up, with the, the way Inzaghi gets them set up. And, the first 20 minutes was always going to be big, and I thought Inter were brilliant. I thought they, they really nullified an awful lot of what Manchester City have when you look at the Marco, the left back up against Bernardo Silva. Absolutely brilliant. I know Silva in the 70th minute started to come into it, but even Dumfries on the other side against Grealish. Grealish has been brilliant all season, or for most of the season, and Dumfries barely got a kick Grealish, and Grealish even said that in his interview after the game. I know it's a, pretty easy to tell the truth when you have the Champions League in your hand, so he said oh, he was awful. And even a Serbia up against Haaland. Haaland barely had a kick. He had that one chance that Onana saved in the first half. Mm-hmm. But other than that, I thought uh, I thought Inter Milan were brilliant. And the game did ebb and flow. Um, the Bernardo Silva chance in the first few minutes, he cuts in on his left foot, hits him wide, and you're thinking, OK, let's see. Like City look like they're hitting a bit of form here. Then all of a sudden, uh, De Bruyne starts to get into the game. He's, he finds Haaland with that pass. Haaland goes through, and it's a good save. But then, uh, De Bruyne comes off, Foden comes on, Inter Milan are grown into the game and thinking this has the feel of one of those sucker punches again for Manchester City. So, a half time, you're thinking Inter Milan will be over the moon with how things have gone. They've got the half time. City haven't really, haven't really clicked. So many of their 10, 5 yard, 10 yard passes were sloppy. They were over hit, they were under hit. Ederson, the goalkeeper, I've never seen him look that shaky before in my life. Mm. It was, it was a, a he had the ball in his own six-yard box. He wasn't being pressed. Inter Milan were waiting to go and press. And he tries to play the ball out to Nathan Ackley in the left-back position. And he just chipped it out of play. And you're thinking, oh my God, if I seen that in Fairview Park, I'd be screaming my head off. And you could see Pep Guardiola screaming and relax at his players. And these are just things you didn't see with Manchester City. They looked rattled. They really did. And all of a sudden, they get in behind. It's a brilliant little ball in by Akanji down in, uh, into the 18-yard box. 
Bernardo Silva pulls it back. And I think it's probably the fourth time that Rodri got forward in the whole game. And even his finish is brilliant because there's so many Inter Milan bodies ahead of him. He can easily put your laces through that and get a deflection, go wide. Anything can happen. So in that moment when the ball drops, to just use those two defenders as a, as a target to go around them. Brilliant, brilliant stuff. And Inter Milan, I think, would have woke up on, on, on the Sunday and thought, how have we not won that game of football? Or at least brought it to extra time. Because when Lukaku comes on, you're thinking, is he going to have something, you know, with the way he is with English football, with <laughs> some of the stuff English fans say about him. So he come on, done really well. DeMarco hits the crossbar. It drops to Lukaku in the six-yard box. Oh, sorry, it drops again to DeMarco in the six-yard box. And you're thinking, he's going to head it in. And it hits Lukaku on the ankles. You're thinking, my God, like, if a Manchester City player had to defend it that well, you'd, you'd have been tapping him on the back. But then he, he gets another chance six yards out. He actually does quite well to divert the cross. He gets a good, good chunk of the ball. It just hits Edison in, in the shin. It bounces up. And even after that, Ruben Diaz is four or five yards out. The ball's coming at his head. He does really, really well to divert that away from his goal and not score an OG. So I think overall, Manchester City probably a little bit lucky to win the game. But... I just had the feeling that City were probably in third or fourth gear, and there's very, very few teams in, in European football that can go and win the Champions League final when they're in third or fourth gear. So there is huge positives in it for Manchester City. Obviously, groundbreaking. Uh, the treble, only the two Manchester clubs now have done the treble. But yeah, the big, big, big flaws uh, turned up in the Manchester City game. But I don't think it was, I don't think uh, Pep Guardiola was paying too much attention to that because finals are once off. So much pressure on every single one of the players, but they got that, you know, monkey off the back now, so to speak. And yeah, you know, Pep Guardiola straight after he said they want to catch Ray on Madrid in the Champions League final. So you're thinking, <laughs> don't have your two minutes left when we're back on the horse. So yeah, good luck. It, it doesn't look like he's going to be getting any easier, or that City are going to be taking their foot off the gas. Yeah, and uh, I, think, I suppose, David, um, you know, there's the the view that this is going to be a platform for City to go on and win um, a lot more. There's a couple of caveats, though. Um, just there was a piece in The Guardian that um, Pep Guardiola probably will leave once the remaining two years of his contract um, are up. And and also there are the uh, the 115 charges that are looming. We don't know what way that's going to go. There's a, there's a long way to go in terms of the investigation. But the future yeah. looks bright, but with some clouds there as well. Yeah, like I, it's one of them where I always feel as if every any ecosystem of football, if it's a, if it's a team or a squad, it's always very delicate. Do you know what I mean? Like, let's be honest with this with City. Like Guardiola is the man who's who this project was created for essentially in terms of when Abu Dhabi, Abu Dhabi took over eventually when he was leaving Barcelona and then he went to was it Bayern after that and then he had a sabbatical and like when Pellegrini was in charge, they were pretty much higher than his previous executives who were there, all the, the different staff above him at Barcelona to to create this infrastructure essentially for him. That's who that project is is there for him. And actually, yeah, sorry, I sorry, hadn't, hadn't seen that report about about in the Guardian about maybe that you would probably finish in two years. But there so wasn't that whole there was that whole sense said about about him after a few years at City that he only does a few years and then he'll because he works so intensely, uh, or maybe then how he likes to work that he'll. He takes breaks for sure. Only a couple of years ago, he, he signed a new, a new deal when people seemed to think he was on the way out. And like it does strike, I know he said that. I think one of the quotes he said was, oh, some teams disappear after they win a Champions League and he doesn't want that to happen. And let's be honest, well, just catching, catching Real Madrid, it's, it'll take a long time to do that. I don't think I don't think even he'll still be there when if they were to, to try and get that far. But the fact that how he was talking afterwards, it kind of strike he, he mentioned, mentioned Jack Grealish. And maybe it's the only thing, this is the only thing that you would think of that could distract City or would maybe act as a def- or as a, something that could maybe be their downfall next season, but not afterwards. Is lads like Jack Grealish were saying, you know, this is what he wanted to achieve in his life. And he's done it now. Do you know, like he's won a couple of Premier Leagues, he's won the European Cup, he's won the treble. Like these type of lads, maybe who have been part of this, and if they lose that hunger, you know that's what Roy Keane obviously spoke about, wasn't it? When when United were dominating in the Premier League and they couldn't after winning the European Cup in ninety nine, when they when they won the treble, they couldn't quite get back over the line in in Europe. It took them nine years to get back and win that to win it in two thousand and eight under Alex Ferguson, and that's the only thing that but that will maybe stop stop City uh, going is maybe if some of the some players who have achieved what they've achieved now don't hit those same standards that Guardiola demands and 
next season could be a big learn. And that's the only thing that I think people on the outside would be looking at would be clinging on to would be that like where how how much hunger they have to go and dominate because like I was writing a piece about it for the forty two, just watching the match on TV and just making that point, like the nature of how the game went. It's kind of like it just shows you like the city team can grind out a result as well in a game like that when they are poor and they still have that like everyone saw and all well, listen no one's blind to what's going on here with the whole sports washing project and there it is those 115 charges and everyone knows what's going on but like it's not just a great football team in terms of great footballers that has been assembled here it's clearly a, a group of characters too you know like you have to respect that in terms of a team of what they've done because that was forced 20, 25 minutes when Inter were on top and Inter just, they just didn't seem good enough to be capable of actually punishing them. And I think maybe City kind of realised that and you kind of have to respect that, you know what, they were able to grind it out and do what, what all the best teams do. Like they've been sensational in so many games before that against Real Madrid in the semi final, especially at home against Bayern Munich. They were absolutely phenomenal in those games. That's what got them to this. And to the final and finals naturally can just be a bit scrappy, can't they? Just because people, what's on, what's on the line, and even the best players will realise that it's the pinnacle for them, you know. So there's always going to be that bit of a tail off, maybe in performance, but that quality from Rodri, how he just caressed, caressed the goal. You know what I mean? Uh the the, the finish rather than blemming it in and whatever. And like he was saying about seeing if he saw a goalkeeper doing what Ederson did in Fairview Park, but I think he might have scored a few of those in Fairview Park himself growing up that, that Roger did, you know, coming in at the right time and just, it's the sort of goal you would expect the left forward to score, you know, it was, had a bit more class about it rather than just a rocket. Yeah, and uh, obviously... Sorry, Pete, that, that, that wasn't me, that wasn't me trying to lick your arse there, you know, it was just... <laughs> yeah. yeah. That makes a change. Yeah, for sure. But obviously, look, the Champions League for this season is over, but uh, they're already uh, preparing for next season. The primary round draw for round one um, of the qualifiers will be next week, 20th of June, and Shamrock Rovers are seeded in it. And next season happens to be the last of the current format as well, with a move to this Swiss Swiss model for, um, from the 2024-25 season. But with some of these things, sometimes it's a case of if it's not broken, why try and fix it? But um, obviously, um, there's always finances and different um, things involved there. But in terms of domestic uh, soccer in the League of Ireland uh, Premier Division, men's Premier Division, Cork City lost 2-1 at home to Dundalk. Derry City and Bowles uh, drew nil all. Drawdy United beat St. Pat's 2-1. Shells and Sligo Rovers drew one all. And Shamrock Rovers beat UCD 4-0. And um, starting first on Derry and Bowles, that's listen to Rory Higgins. Um, the Derry City manager was not happy not to get a penalty for a handball by Christian Novak late on. they just seen it in there. Uh, for the life of me, um, I'll never know how we, we, we didn't get it. Uh, especially we're, we're, we're in a tricky moment at the minute um, and that's when you rely on, on, on decisions to, to be right. You're not asking for uh, special treatment, you're asking for... Um, that's, that's a huge, huge decision. It's extremely late in the game. We're on top in that period um, and, it's, and, and it's a real key moment in the game and it's gone against us and um all right, so that's my answer to that one and in a moment like that you know by the reaction of your players you know by the body language of the people involved no doubt in your mind at the moment when it happens that a penalty should have gone your way absolutely and uh, i got a yellow card for for appealing for a penalty that we we should have got so uh football's an emotional game of course you're going to appeal i didn't use any language whatsoever. I appealed for a handball that we should have got and I get a yellow card. So uh, sometimes people have to understand that this is an emotional game. But listen, uh, the players' commitment um, players' commitment and endeavour tonight w- was on the money and uh, we weren't brilliant by any stretch, but we created some decent chances. We played with more passion, more intensity on a difficult pitch. And... Uh, I once the players give everything like we asked of them tonight, um, it's a bare minimum. But no one's left anything out there tonight. Appreciate your time, Rory. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so that is Derry City manager Rory Higgins after the nil-all draw between his side and Bohemians, and obviously not happy with the uh, non-awarding of a penalty there. And Keith, I suppose it's not a it's not a result that would have been welcome for either side, albeit maybe Bowles would be slightly happier going into the break with a draw away from home. 
Yeah, I think for Bowes, it's not a bad result at all. Going up to Derry is always a, a difficult place. I know Derry has a few home problems, but nobody nobody licks their lips when they're going up to, to have a game of football up in Derry. So, look, I, I understand all the all the frustration in Rory's voice there. You can hear it, and I've had a look at it. I do think it was a penalty myself, and if I was a player, a coach, a manager there, I'd have been screaming to the high heavens as well. Sometimes there is just a little bit of a common sense. Rory saying he didn't use any bad language, which we have to take him on his word. If he hasn't done that and he's just appealed for the penalty, then maybe the yellow card is a little bit harsh. But I, I think Rory's frustration is coming from, I, I watched him against Pats. They were very, very poor against Pats. Mm-hmm. The performance was, was really, really poor. And he said there himself, the performance wasn't great, but maybe we'd done just enough. We had a couple of chances, maybe done enough just to win the game. I'd be I'd be having a look again at the squad, and I know the performance was a little bit better than it was against Pats, but with the talent he has in that team, he has to be the man. The more you know, whether they get that penalty or not, I still think they should be going on and beating Bowers at home with the like I say with the with the squad that they have. And sometimes you you start focusing your energy on things you can't control, and whether the referee is going to give a penalty or not. If it should be a penalty, it's we're all saying it should be a penalty, but you can't control what the referee is going to do. So trying to vert your energy back into the squad and maybe, you know, I, I think there's an awful lot more to come from this dirty team. I think they, they've been poor as a, as a team to some individuals as well who haven't covered themselves in glory. I know they've had one or two injuries, but I still think there should be a little bit more here. And I, I remember speaking about dirty last season and thinking if they could just turn a couple of those draws, a couple of those losses into wins, they'd be right on the coattail of the Shamrock Rovers. And again, they just keep losing ground and ground and ground. And the worrying thing for me is that Shamrock Rovers are probably in second or third here, and they're already, you know, starting to starting to creep away at the top of the league. So somebody needs to take this by the scruff of the neck and give us a race. Otherwise, I think Shamrock Rovers could, you know, get away from everybody at a canter. Yeah, and David, I mean, the gap now with six points, Shamrock Rovers after that four 0 win over UCD, and we're talking about two gaps now. So a huge one at the bottom where UCD are, you know, well off the pace now in terms of yeah. having any chance of survival, but at the top as well. That gap at the mid-season break is six points. Uh, when you consider also Shamrock Rovers have been very up and down during the season, it's pretty significant. Yeah, and no, all it is like again, it's, I think we've been on the on it a couple of times talking about this, where we've kind of said, or well, I've said as well, you know, if if Derry are able to just hang on, and because we're going through a tricky period, just hang on to on, on to Rovers' coattails, and then it was a case of well, it didn't look as if Rovers were capable of actually properly pulling away, but. It kind of always seemed that one was having a dip when the other was, and they they were always going to nip nip and like neck and neck, and one like daddy were top for a while. Ball, well, well, they were up there. Balls were top, then Rovers were top, and then Rovers were stuttering just when it looked as if Rovers were were maybe going to pull away. And then now that's kind of happened now. Like they're six six points clear, and it's it's got again. It's it's only going to be a case of now coming into the summertime and coming into the European games. Like daddy squad, even to this point, is being stretched. Where we've seen even like. Keep mentioning the game against Pat, so I was covering that game as well. And obviously, Patrick McElhenney went off. And other than the first 10 15 minutes of that game, Derry were by far second best in, in, in it. You know, Pats were able, and I hadn't seen it for first ball. I hadn't really seen it. Pats do it to a, to a, a team maybe who were above them, top two type. But I also hadn't seen it happen to Derry where they were actually just overpowered in every department in terms of like. Pats had so much more energy than them, you know, and and even the calibre of play was so much more impressive. And you kind of you just don't associate that with Derry over the last couple of years. They always seem that they have a bit of a strength about them, and they just seemed a bit weaker. They just seemed that maybe not to have that same that same grit to maybe get through tricky moments. And Pats were able to punish them. Like they got you know, the clean sheet there. They think there was a one win and five now. They've got like Derry and, and stuff and. It's kind of it's again. It's coming back to what happened last season, and, and again, it's something that was saying that last season they had this dip around a similar time where they didn't proper. I think they won a game for nearly two months, you know. And obviously now it was the mid-season break, probably coming at a right time for them to be able to try and maybe get some bodies back. Although I think McElhenney could be a bit more of a longer term issue. I'm not sure what the situation is there with that with that Achilles, but just not having a game, being able to kind of refocus somehow, do something to try and and change things because. Going into the break, it looks as if it's only one. What we thought might, might be a, a really could be a good title race. It looks as if uh, if the, the same form continues going into into the into July time and the European games come because that's when Derby's gonna are gonna be tested even more. 
well then like I can't see I can't see Rovers slipping to the same extent that they've already kind of already like they seem to have been able to get their act together a lot quicker and and put a decent run of form together which I think I can see them continuing on over the summer and beyond. Yeah, and then Shells and Sligo they share the spoils in in their game and probably a good point for Sligo Rovers with. Niall Morhan's uh, long-range goal, um, a great finish in that game. But I think the significance is on the shell side, David, in terms of Akun Ilikali, and he's yeah. become the, the, become the uh, majority shareholder there, confer- confirmed on Friday. Now, we talked about him a little, a few, I think probably about a couple of months ago now, when he was being linked with Dundalk. Uh, he's obviously the owner of Hull City as well, but that's, um, and considering Damien Duff has talked about investment during the uh, yeah. during the preseason, this is, uh, this is a big step for them. Although with, with ownership changes, there's pros and cons, so it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. Yeah, look, it's, it's one of them where it's, We've seen it. We were chatting about Man City and their their multi club group, the whole City Football Group. This is that on a on a much smaller scale. Like uh, obviously, like Scorpion has come in, and um, obviously he has Hull and Shelbourne are now are going to be part of that. Like I, um, when the story broke, because obviously it was kind of coming. This would have been back to at the start of the year. It's kind of been obviously coming and coming a little bit in terms of. Was he done dark? There was talks there that didn't materialise. There was a brief kind of suggestion about St. Pat's, but that was shot down very, very quickly. Uh, it did look as if before Christmas that it was going to be Sport Republic who were the owners of Southampton. They were they they were in the in talks to do some kind of deal with with Shelburne, but I don't think that well it didn't it didn't uh, progress um any forward than maybe initial dialogue and all the rest. And then yeah, then obviously Damien Duff has got his wish. He was kind of saying you know that. His budget would have quadrupled if Sport Republic had come in, and that's maybe the kind of that's kind of the boost now where you're looking at here. Like we spoke to a few people about coming on tour on when the when the story break was a tour, say or was it Friday? Go any tour the back end of last week and ring around a few people who would would have dealt with him in football at Hull, who would have done deals with him and stuff, and then also people who would have been covering the club. And they they, they speak of a fellow who's very respectful. They speak of a fellow who's very open. Yeah, he'll make mistakes and he'll there's errors there, but like he seems to be a very kind of honest, honest guy and is upfront with what with what he wants to uh, wants to achieve. I was I did I was speaking with uh, the local radio station for for whole over on, on BBC and I just caught the tail end of one conversation, and it seems to be that it could be an initial two million pound I think as well or two million. I wasn't sure if it was pound or euro. I'm guessing they were talking in fairly a pound of what's of an investment that's coming in. They've spoken about it in the club of you know that it's throughout the whole infrastructure. It's not just going to be the first team, but then you see it in the statement and they're talking about like the, the symmetry between the clubs and all the rest. But it's like Shelburne are on the lower end of the food chain here. Do you know what I mean? It's going to be a case of well, what are they going to see the club for? Like speak of the people. It does seem as if there'll be a kind of director of football type appointment made at Shells to be that bit of a bridge of a gap between. Um, between the two clubs because it was so sort, of, sort of like the John Walters um thing previously at Waterford I guess between yeah and that, yeah yeah essentially but I don't know from what from what we and again I wrote about this on on the forty two last week my understanding is it will be someone who obviously has already been involved with Irish football and not a case of the same person um because at the moment there's what happened was obviously a a a whole initially like they was in it. In the first transfer window, the owner was maybe having trying to have a bit more of a say on players coming in, and as I was putting in, his wings were clipped, and he's got the uh, a kind of the the oh say for me the vice chairman there at, at Hull now will has kind of a greater sense, a greater kind of dealings now and greater purpose in, in terms of the actual football operations at Hull, but it does look as if to be someone else in the other side of things now coming in to to kind of bridge that gap, and should we heard um. Liam Racine are talking about, you know, the style of play and it's going to all be a line and stuff. That's stuff coming down the line that will, obviously, as I mentioned, it's the honeymoon period at the moment, but there's going to be stuff happening now over the next little while that's going to test test the nature of the of the relationship, you know? Yeah, and uh, also, um, draw the United uh, got a good result against Pats, Keith, and you were watching this one. Adam Foley's opener, brilliant goal, and... Uh, Obviously, the victory pushes them up to seventh. And uh, considering Pats were on such a good run heading into towards the break, it's a uh, it's a really impressive result. Yeah, Pats went there uh, absolutely full of confidence, playing some great football under John Daly, and 
yeah, you're, you're expecting Pats to go and take the ball by the horns and go into the break, you know, sitting pretty, having done really, really well under the new manager. The, fo- the first goal and got the Adam Foley uh, volley, as you're saying, Rafa, what a goal. You know, it, it's a, a set piece that's defended not badly by St. Pats. They get rid of it. It's another ball over the top. Adam Foley just steadies his set and volleys it with his right foot right into the top corner from the, the edge of the 18 yard box. A brilliant, brilliant finish. And I didn't see St. Pats getting into the game. The pitch looked really, really dry. It looked bobbly. You know, the, the slick pass and it wasn't really an option. So now you're thinking the Pats. Right, where's plan B? How are you going to hit the back of the net here? And they get a set piece, and there's a the car, the, the cross is probably a little bit under hit. And all of a sudden, there's a little tangle of legs. And I think Chris Forrester does really well to avoid the penalty. I, I think there is a coming together, but I think he initiates it. I think he knows what he's doing in the box, and the referee buys it. So, clever play from Chris, but to be fair, I thought it was a really, really soft penalty. But Pat's found a way back into the game, and that's what that's what you need in these hard moments, just to get through it somehow. And they did that, and then you're thinking in the second half, right? Let's kick on. Let's see if they can go and get the second goal. And I think over the 90 minutes after they, they three shots on target, they would only 48 percent of the ball, which is not what you'd expect from a Pat's team. But I think that goes to show you how bad the pitch was. That ball retention wasn't really an option on it. And the, the last minute, when when Dara Markey goes and goes and wins the game for for dropping in the last minute. It, it really is nonsensical stuff from St. Pat's. They, they have a free kick uh, out on the right wing. The 93 minutes are up. They're, they're in at a time, in at a time. They put the ball into the box. They managed to hack it clear to the, to the halfway line. And I'm, I'm not sure which Pat's player it was, but one of them gets there first. And Dara Mark is going to press him. And he just falls over. The Pat's player just falls over. It's not a foul by Dara Mark. It's just a little bit of pressure. And all the pass player has to do is volley it out of the stands, volley it out of the stage and take your draw and you get out of there. He doesn't. For some reason, he's trying to buy a foul in the last seconds of the game, which is, as they say, absolutely nonsensical to me. Dara Markey picks it up, throws it into the box, plays a little one-two and drop it to go and win the game. So brilliant from it, drop the point of view, to just hang around. The Zoya walk rate was brilliant from them. They didn't allow Pats to get their foot in the ball and get their, get their head up. I wouldn't say uh, draw the deserve it, but I definitely wouldn't say Pats deserved the win either. So maybe a draw would have been a, a more favourable result for both teams, but draw the nick it at home, and that's what you do. If, if you walk until the 95th, 96th minute, you will get your rewards, and that's what draw did. Yeah, and similarly to Pats as well, um, Cork couldn't keep their run going, um, but Dundalk now, a couple of good results yeah. strung together now, um, Keith, and within touching distance of uh, the European spots as well. Yeah, uh, Dundalk, I just don't know what the... You just you can't back Dundalk in the minute, can you? just do not know what you're going to get from them when uh, when they went to beat Cork, but they went one nail down in the game. And if Dundalk have all the talent in the world. Stephen O'Donnell's really good manager, has done well drilled, but they get they picking up these losses, these draws, and you're thinking, on paper, you expect them to go and do it. But to be fair, I've been, I've been really impressed with Cork since, uh, since they've come up, I thought. It would be obviously a straight shootout between them and UCD, who's going to prop up the league. They they fired away, got themselves away from that. It's going to be UCD who are who are bottom by you know UCD are miles off at the minute. So if Cork can just hang around in ninth position, maybe try and drag get closer to to draw it or whoever it is in eighth eighth position, just try and stay close to the league because we all know the the relegation playoff will be coming for Cork. It's just try and not get too detached from the rest of the league, stay in it and. Like I said, even a 2-1 uh, defeat to, to Dundalk at home is not a bad result. They're throwing, they're throwing punches in the league. They're winning a couple of games. So, yeah, very impressed with Cork, with Dundalk. Just just too flaky, no consistency. Yeah, and in the first division, Athlone Town beat Kerry 1-0. Cove Ramblers also won away with a 1-0 victory at Treaty. Waterford be, uh, beat Bray Wanderers 3-1. Wexford were beaten 2-0 at home by Galway United, who stay 10 points clear at the top. And then Finn Harps beat Longford Town 3-2 away from home. And as I said, 10-point gap at the top, Galway clear of Waterford. And then there's a there's very few points separating sort of third all the way down to about eighth. Um, in the women's... Sorry, Raph, sorry, Raph, I do feel as if I owe Ronan Cochran an apology because I remember when he got nominated for Player of the Month, I think it was, was it last, at the start of last month, or you yes. at the back end, and I find a part of it scoring and saying this is like he's scoring goals. This is exactly what he should be doing. You know, he's he's a full time player in the league that's predominantly part time and and all the rest of it. But yeah, no, I think it's fair to say he's scoring twenty five goals at this point. Warren's a bit of a, 
of an apology on my front and actually a bit of an appreciation. So, um, you know, fair play to, uh, to Ronald Cochran because that's 24 goals at this stage is absolutely incredible. Yeah, uh, and in the women's Premier Division, Galway got back to winning ways, 2-0 victory at Sligo. Um, huge game at the top, P-Mount United, a winner, 1-0 winners over Shamrock Rovers and just tightening that uh, grip they have at the top. DLR Waves and Treaty drew nil all. Bowes beat Cork City 2-1 and then Shelburne beat Wexford 5-0. So Wexford having a bit of a struggle of a season so far down in sixth. P-Mount now six points clear of Shells. Um, who are level on points with Shamrock Rovers and Bowes just a couple of points behind that. But before we go, just very briefly, David, um, one of the big stories, and maybe we might have time in the next few weeks to come back to it, but it's the FAI seeking $863 million in, infra- in an infrastructure plan that would be spread over 15 years and pretty much front-loaded, though, um, with the initial investment being... Um, I suppose more lucrative and then um, kind of spread out over the 15 years but they're committed to spending about 20% um, of the investment with the rest hope for public and private uh, contribution and they're seeking 60% from government which is about 517 million and 20% from local project partners and um, I don't know if you had a chance to read through the uh, the review that they, they published I, I had a look at it over the weekend just went through the different pages on it but um, ambitious is one of the words I think that has been that has been used. Yeah, like and amb- ambitious but needed and ambitious and also like let's let's be honest and and the point was made in the in the I wasn't covering the actual announcement itself in terms of the the, the press conference and stuff, but because it was made clear, it's like this was an issue not just with, with Irish football but just Irish sport in terms of where 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 the government and where the, the backing is in terms of funding. To other in terms of be- benchmarking it against other European countries, and that's obviously at the forefront of this as well. That this isn't obviously this is the FAI point and trying to put that best foot forward and put their, their case forward and explain the the benefits and it kind of comes in the back of what well, obviously what happened around the, the situation with the the horse and the the greyhound uh, Grey, fund and talking about the betting levy and the tax that's involved in there and it's just at the point now where I think it's something where especially in Irish football and with the FAI, that's a case that they now realise that this is the stuff that, that has to be done in terms of going in proper lobbying, proper kind of discussion about this, putting proper proposals forward and trying to drive stuff through, having the, getting the, being involved with the right people and talking and, and, and having these conversations because previously when it wasn't the case, well, there was no kind of proper full on academy structure of what's of what's happening. We see that now in terms of of Irish football and what's and what's coming. Like this is, you know, there's it was the talk about wasn't it wasn't it as well about kind of high private private funding as well from high net worth individuals. But it does seem to be a case now where obviously it's something that's only in terms of the, you see the, the the figures that are being bandied about and what's actually going to be needed for the level of the infrastructure and what's going to be required. It's gonna require government will as much as that and, you know not just money but actual will to help drive this forward as much as there's good people obviously involved in, in the FAI and, and wanting to bring this forward when you have that government back and that that's there as well and, and and the will and through all aspects and through all facets of of, the, of these proposals that's what's going to bring this forward and from the basis of and I think again I said this only a couple of weeks ago to ourselves when I was just saying like there's so many good people Keith and obviously vouch, vouch for this as well there's so many good people and specifically within Irish football because that's what we're, we're here to talk about from a coaching perspective who are already working in academies and managers and all different levels and it's just creating that environment where they're able to actually properly properly do the job where they don't have to make other huge sacrifices in their life to try and benefit some of these promising young footballers because like Stephen, again, Stephen Kenny spoke about this today, you know, in terms of the industry and still think it's very, we should be very kind of sceptical a little bit about it. I don't think we need to create a mini version of what's in the UK. You kind of walk to what's, to the Irish parameters and to the, the landscape that's here and, and develop something that works. But as Stephen Kenny made the point that he was talking about, it, you know, like, because there are no proper jobs here for, for people and people do have, people have to take huge risks that can have an impact on their own family good people who are already working might eventually fade away. And the longer it goes on, and especially with the development of the, of the academies and the work and the stress that's going to come with that, it needs to be a proper industry. It needs to have proper backing behind it. And to do it quickly, because it needs to be done quickly. And you mentioned it, 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 it we talk about magic money trades, not so much that. It's 
the, the investment that's needed for this to happen very, very quickly can only really come from government, you know, and I think that's now what is what is required. But again, that document obviously came, came out and now it's just going to be a case of playing out and saying, well, making sure that the right people are spoken to and the right, the right conversations are being had, because obviously that's in public, but the lobbying and all the rest of it, that's now what's going to be important too, because that's the other side of, of getting these deals done. Yeah, and there's a huge focus when you read through it. It's on a lot of it. There's also bits on like improvement facilities for women and girls, and that's hugely important now with the the World Cup coming and the impact that's going to have or has already happened in terms of qualification. And then also there's a lot in terms of benchmarking as well, comparing uh the, comparing the Irish situation to the UEFA industry standards for capita. Like for example, um apparently Ireland is short of one thousand full size grass pitches. But look, this is something we're going to come back to in future podcasts. Obviously, with the, the Greece match, uh, we're a little bit tight for time, so we're gonna. But just, ra- just, yeah, yeah. just on final one on that. Just I think again, it, it can actually sum it up for for a lot of people. But like, say for example, I know Luton Town now just got promoted, but there's more people working full time in Luton Town's academy that are working the entire full time in Irish football. Yeah, at, at academy level. So that just that just kind of will give an indication of you know for a national association and for for the for the clubs that are now under that umbrella. What of how like you know what I mean? That's what sums it up really. Yeah, no, and it reminds me of uh, what I was reading in Vasilis Sambrakos' book as well about Greece prior to Otto Rehagel coming in. It was a bit of a mess and, and way behind uh, kind of European industry standards. But as I said, um, Ireland against Greece, that's coming up in Athens on Friday night. It's going to be live on RT2 and the RT player and also the Gibraltar match next Monday. Podcast is going to be back next Tuesday. We're going to be reviewing this entire week and also building towards the first of the warm up matches for the Ireland women's team as well. But uh, for now, David Snade, thanks a million for your time and also Pete Tracy.